What's up, Guru Nation? Let's demystify clinical research. Guru Nation, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. It means a lot to me. Also, for the people on Instagram, I am live. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe there. And like I said, shameless plug for Dr. Joe Show. Uh, it's on the Yuma Clinical Trials Instagram. We're going to go live. And then that's the second channel for Dr. Joe Show. Uh, check it out. But anyways, for this episode, we want to talk about monitoring. So the dynamics of monitoring SDV versus SDR. This is obviously good for CRAs or people like brand new. Thank you uh, very much for, to the commenter who just got a CRA job. Uh, congratulations. Look, it's it's a lot going on in research, like source data review, source data verification. There's a lot of data in this industry. There's a lot of things, both at the site and the CRA level, you have to check for when it comes to one protocol, like any protocol. I'm randomly on one of our sponsors in Nato. I'm doing, uh, I'm applying for a study for depression right now. And look, they've got like qualifications. They've got all these things that you've got to commit to doing. Do you have a negative 20 fridge? Do you have psychometric rater scales that are available to do uh, rating scales? Do you have um, staff that are bilingual? Do you have PK capabilities? And that's just what you're doing. That's not like the data you're recording. And that's not necessarily even um, following the protocol. That's just doing assessments. Like there's one thing about doing assessments and there's another thing uh, when it comes to following the protocol. And when you're a site or when you're a CRA monitoring the site, you've got to look at the details and you've got to look at all the, all the data, of course, that's source data verification. Does the source match up with the EDC? Does the source actually, is the source actually the same thing as what's on the EDC system? That's just simple stuff. That's like if you do vitals and the vitals are like 130 over 85 on the source, are they the same thing on the EDC? That's not that difficult. You don't even need training for that. Literally anyone can, can, can do that. That's the easy part. The difficult part is, well, when it's 140 over 90, is it now an AE? Is it now a new medical history? Is it is it an undocumented previous medical history of hypertension? Those are the, where it starts to get complex, and you got to do some calculus, meaning you got to integrate all the factors. So that's the data, but what does the PI think? And what do their medical records say of this patient? Do they actually have hypertension? What was their blood pressure at screening and baseline compared to now? Well, if they didn't have a history of hypertension, maybe it's a new new onset of hypertension. And that could come with age-related conditions. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's an AE, but if it happens in a study, it could be an AE, elevated blood pressure, but also new medical history. And that's where the monitor will come in and query this should be moved to medical history instead of AE, or let's get the medical monitor to figure out um, how this pertains to the, the actual study. And then there's there's even further things, like there could be lab results that come back. One of the studies I'm doing on, I just had to revise the source for one of our obesity studies. You've got to look at things like liver function enzymes, and you've got to look at things like um, calcitonin, as a random example that stuck in my head, well, normally you just you don't really pay attention to these things, but these are lab values of special interest for for the study. And there's actually things you got to do if their calcitonin levels are elevated and they weren't at baseline. You need to do this. You need to look for this particular adverse event or if their liver function enzymes were elevated and they weren't at baseline or if their GFR was low and it wasn't at baseline or maybe it was there's all those things mean different things and it's not just so simple as put what's on this source in the edc and that's it 
and put what's on this source here and then let me check that it's correct. Like that's just simple stuff. You don't need qualified people to do that. What you need in coordinators, what you need in CRAs are people willing to look at the meaning of all these things, specifically how it pertains to patient safety and how it pertains to study compliance and the actual protocol itself. And when you start missing these things frequently, those are deviations. And if you have numerous deviations, I was just telling my coordinators today, shout out to Lana. I see Lana on here on the live stream. I was just talking to my coordinators today about sending IRB deviations. Well, did you know that the IRB can send things directly to the FDA and say, hey, you might want to go look at this site. We just got a batch of deviations all for the same related thing. They're all significant. Well, then the FDA is going to audit you. And then that means that the coordinator dropped the ball, the CRA dropped the ball, everyone's dropping the ball, and the FDA is ultimately the one to come in and say, you know, is it a 483, like Redo said, or not? And we don't even want to get to that point. Or if we do get to that point, we want to make sure that we go, just like Brad Hightower, he just finished his FDA audit, no findings. And that's what you want to do. So over-document all the time. Document your rationale. Document the PI's rationale. And when it comes to source data verification and source data review, from a CRA perspective, we actually focus on this a lot in the CRA Academy, which is enrolling now for the our, our January 2024 class. So check it out. Links in the show notes. Just like Devani says, congratulations on your CRA job. Understand mechanism of action of the protocol helps tremendously. Exactly, because when you know the mechanism of action of a IP, then you know what the adverse events of special interest are and you know exactly what to look for. Or you know what the potential hazards are of a study and you're not going to enroll somebody who could possibly get those adverse events of special interest. And that's really where clinician expertise has to come in. But that's also in reality what the coordinator, the coordinator is the one running the entire show. So if the coordinator doesn't know what they're doing, if all the coordinator is doing is like, let's look and make sure that we did this vital signs and now let's make sure that we, we, we dispense the investigational product, but you're not looking between the lines to see how all these assessments relate to one another in the context of actual study visit, then you are missing major things. Uh, we have a depression study. We have all kinds of rating scales. We have, here's the big one that people are not ready for, patient reported outcomes. We used to overlook these things in our industry. These things are becoming so important. You got to look at what the patients are actually putting in their patient reported outcomes because they could be telling you they have an adverse event without them telling that to you by opening their mouth. They're putting that on the patient reported outcome. So if they're putting answers to all the suicidality questions of, I think I'm better off dead, but no one's really reading those things because the patient didn't tell you that at the visit, well, it's in the diary. You should have seen it. And that's something that you need to at least have a documented progress note of the PI discussed with the patient. They don't think the patient actually is suicidal, but that the patient was retrained on how to answer questionnaires properly because it happens all the time that patients don't really read what they're doing and just click buttons just to get through the task. So if that's the case, explain it because if it's not documented, it didn't happen. That's in our last video. And in this video, if you're a CRC or a CRA doing source data review, source data verification, you need to look and understand the difference between these two things and how all these elements sort of integrate with one another. So those are all super important things and in the just regular conduct of doing a study. We didn't even discuss, right, investigational product accountability, and we didn't even discuss regulatory, which regulatory is a whole nother video, but we didn't even discuss investigational product accountability, which is a huge part of every trial and not just doing the fact that the assessment says, did you dispense the IP? Yes or no. But 
how compliant was the patient? Did the patient actually dose properly? Today, Lana was here. We had a patient and we actually did math like really quick. We counted wrong. We counted 13 days instead of 14. And we saw that they, we thought they took an extra pill. But in reality, we just counted wrong. And we went back and said, no, no, that's, uh, it's actually 14. They dosed exactly correct. So little things like that, you can also make mistakes. We're all humans. And then CRAs need to find out because that's the job as a, of a CRA. So this example of what I just described of us counting that the patient should have taken 13 pills, but they took 14, a good CRA would actually go count, count the days and the pills and say, no, the patient actually dosed correctly. You documented it incorrect. Please go fix it. And that's a query that's not auto-generated. Those are not auto-generated queries. Those are human being derived queries that that's where the CRAs earn their big bucks, right? Um, so this is what we've got to look at when we're monitoring, coordinating, um, source data verification versus source data review. If you do a protocol deviation, they are unavoidable. Not every protocol deviation is IRB reportable. Even if your CRA thinks it is, it has to impact patient safety in a major way. So an informed consent, those deviations do count, but there are a lot of gray area where one can argue, well, this did impact patient safety, but it wasn't in a major way. And another one said, well, this didn't impact patient safety in a major way because I'm on an IRB portal right now. There's a deviation submission, but it says major deviation submission. So what's major, what's minor? Well, no one really gives you guidelines. You could ask your CRA, you can ask the medical monitor, but when it comes to IRB, it's all about patient safety. So was the patient safety jeopardized? And if you can argue that no, it wasn't, and your CRA is not pushing back, then no, it wasn't. But if it was, then you should self-report. And when, they, when you do, you need to submit I would submit, especially if it's happening a few times, a corrective action, preventative action, CAPA plan to show the IRB and any future regulators that you actually are taking the necessary steps to correct the action and prevent the action from happening again. So that's source data verification, source data review, integration, in a nutshell, it goes a lot deeper because if you get into medical history, some of these patients' medical histories are very extensive. And it's very easy to miss things. It, when they're taking 30 medications, you better make sure that all 30 of those are okay to be on the study and they're not excluded. And they don't always list them by brand name or generic name. Sometimes they just list them as class. And whenever in doubt, you need to document to the medical monitor whether this was okay or not. And oftentimes in the protocols, they'll have medications that are okay for the patient to be on at screening, but they need a washout before randomization, and they even have a washout schedule, oftentimes it's four weeks or and then six weeks of taking a new one before they can get randomized. So just pay attention a lot to the protocols. Uh, and just like Tolu says, major and minor, it's usually is indicated in the protocol, but they can't put every major minor deviation in there. They have guidelines and a lot of the gray areas where you can argue one side or the other. So I think as coordinators, as CRAs, we need to be better informed, better educated for ourselves of how all these things interact and not just look at source data uh, on the source and make sure it's the same as the EDC because that doesn't really tell you anything other than the data is correct, but correct data can also be protocol deviations. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.